Hello and welcome to Geopolitics Talk. So this is kind of going to be a ramble. Um, 10 minutes at most. It is getting pretty late. My grandmother is going to come back in here. So let's go. Plus I have 10% as well. So let's really just go and dig into this right now. So with my geopolitics certificate, I'm going to really teach you about the Russian expansionism, quote unquote, but it is expansionism, but we'll see why it's expansionist in a second. And we're also going to learn about a couple of geopolitical, strategical things, but nothing over the top. Every Everybody could learn this, actually. I learned it pretty quickly, and I still, this is probably the only course where I don't really need a refresher. But then again, I'm talking about war every Tuesday, like every Wednesday, thir- every Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so Monday as well, if, I really up, if I'm really up for it after the beach. But without further ado, ladies, gentlemen, NMB, um... Let's just hop right into it. Let's just hop right into it. So the geopolitical thing of Russia is that Russia is big. Russia is huge. But Russia is also flat. So we have a concept called the Rimland. So the Rimland is basically right there, southern Russia, or pretty much like southern Russia, almost going into Central Asia. And then there is the steppes, or the steppe people, but the steppes as a region. And then there's obviously Central Asia and Northeastern China. Now, the thing about all of these regions is that they're flat. They're pretty much flat. They're like a two by four. They're pretty much flat. Like, whoosh. So basically, you can kind of see where this is going. Russia has been for centuries, from the Mongols to the Nazis to even the potential of NATO from East Germany, has always had the paranoia and rightfully so of being invaded. That's why Russia expanded in the first place. Because Russia was so flat, and especially during the Kievan Rus, and you can hear Kiev, we're going to talk about that one later. You can kind of, you could really sense that Russia has paranoia for a reason. Russia has always been huge, unruly, and flat. Russia cannot control people in Siberia. Russia cannot control people in Tuvan. Russia cannot control Denmark reaching Moscow or St. Petersburg in a week. Russia has no control over the fact that any country at any time, or even a military alliance like mm, NATO, like let's just get the, let's get the elephant out of the room. NATO could reach Moscow in a week, a combined force in a week. Like there's no there's no going around that. You could you could put all the propaganda, all the all the military ads being based. You you could put all of that there, but at the end of the day, Russia is flat. Russia is also Russia is also weak strategically, especially by sea. Now, as you can see, Russia has a lot of coastline. Russia is huge. Russia is big, but Russia is also small. Russia has three ports out of a country of like one million square miles. Russia has four operational ports a year, all year round ports. The Baltic Sea is the only real working port. Now, the Baltic Sea is also the most crucial port because it's the only port. Now, let's get let's get a, let's get out of the way the other ports. There is the Sevastopol port. No, wait, Sevastopol is in Crimea. There is the north. There's the northeast port, which is basically Siberia, Arctic Ocean. The Pacific port, which is pretty much the top of Russia. Going into Greenland, kind of, and there's the Baltic, there's the Baltic one, which is obviously the Baltic, and there is the Black Sea one, which is obviously by Turkey, Dardanelles, Black Sea, stuff like that. Then there's kind of the Barren Strait, which is pretty much the Arctic as well, but it doesn't really go into the Arctic proper, it goes down through America. So, yeah, yeah, I just want to hammer home the enemies and the the strategical strangling of Russian ports. If any conflict was to break out, Russia is at a huge disadvantage, mega huge. Of course, the U.S. could block the Bering Straits all the way in the northeast. Um, the Arctic Ocean is frozen year-round, so who wants to block that? Or Canada, Canada could do it. Canada could do it. Um, of course, the Baltics. The Baltics are very frightened of Russia, and the Baltics leading to the North Sea which are controlled by Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and the United Kingdom. There's actually a group called the GIUK, 
which is Greenland, which is part of Denmark still, Iceland, which is its own country and not part of Denmark, I know, and of course, the United Kingdom, of course. During the Cold War, this was kind of a mini alliance or more of a military maneuver where the GI UK would actually block off Russian Baltic and Barents Sea commercial shipping or war shipping or anything like that. So I'm going to try and get the map for you. But basically there is an island and there is the long stringy island. Russia could not pass that point. The British naval superiority was not that of the heights of 1914 or even 1945. But Britain was still pretty much second place. Or even like 2.5 place with United States and Russia kind of sharing the, the bulk of that. But it is obviously going to be a NATO joint inclusion. So there's number one and number two there. So it's pretty much number one. Number one, right? So there's that. Now, um, Turkey, as we all know, is the best of friends with russia and by best of friends i mean the worst most hated enemies of russia even the authoritarian governments of um of both countries could not stifle that hatred um you can see it with the countless ottoman russia wars the ottoman russia wars are of course world war one and even the caucasus campaign of the soviet incursion back into former Tsarist territory they actually kind of leeway turkey a bit but that is a topic for another day and that is why armenia um has no choice but to love russia not just because they're christian not because the Tur the ottomans did something in 1915 and um not you know because they're wedged between azerbaijan and nadago karabakh but russia has guaranteed the safety of the caucasus from turkey forever pretty much and um azerbaijan wants to go westward as well so that's why azerbaijan is kind of not really supportive of russia but knows that russia could just come in and stamp them out if they wanted to and it is still part of a russian sphere of influence so we've kind of established land sea and now let's go to air there's no secret that anybody could fly over anywhere but russia has it the worst the same gi uk is actually have bases in greenland iceland and united kingdom and they could pretty much intercept and block all Russian air communication and traffic within hours. Now, let's get into some historical concepts and historical connections. Sir. So basically, with my mad rambling on, we have covered land, sea, and air. But let's cover the historic reasons why. Now, back in the day, Kevin Rusk, or Russia, or the Rus, you know, the Tsardom, um, basically, Russia was pretty flat, and Russia was pretty vibing, Russia was cool, and then first the Vikings attack, um, you know, Vikings attack first, so Russia's like, okay, okay, they're white, they're kind of cool, they're kind of um, pillaged and ripped, but they're kind of cool, but this, this, we still need to expand, so they expand a bit more, they get a bit bigger, then the Mongols come from the east, and it's like, whoa, 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 Asians, Asians, they're kind of cool, but I think we need to expand way more, and that's how they conquered, like, all of the continent, not like that, but there were numerous wars, and numerous expeditions, and numerous expansions, because they knew for a long time, especially during the Silk Road era, that Mongols, and the Kanakarnet, and the persians and the emirs and stuff like that and even the chinese um actually could have just like ran across russia you know like especially back on the horseback days there was no air defense system there's nothing so because so you could pretty much be so silent that you could literally like run across the steps and attack russia no matter what so basically that's how we get huge russia and of course they want to expand there's the great game going on during the 19th century you know, just just for filler before we get to the main courses, there is the great game with Britain, which tries to outcompete each other in Central Asia and Asia proper, or Southeast Asia, I should say. So there's that. And then, of course, there's the Caucasian Wars, where they annex ca the Caucasus, and that is for the reasons with Turkey, to actually gain some security from Turkey as well. There's, of course, the westward expansion especially from the new rising kingdom of prussia france and even austria especially after they kind of bond them after the crimean war 
and after that war is really when Russia started to to exponentially start to get some ports and start expanding even more to get some more warm water ports and then after that comes the big boys World War I was kind of devastating for Russia and the whole world as a whole. There's the Russian Revolution and all that. Now, Russia wants to expand, not for imperialism, but to promote the workers, proletariat, and world revolution. But there's a sneaky thing as well. Russia is actually not communist. Russia is a socialist country. They're making way for communism. But if everybody keeps attacking them... Now, Russia has to, you know, you, you know the word, expand, get big, inflation. Now, Russia needs some security and some borders. So, Lenin is like, he's a backpack, so he's a backpack um, revolutionary, by the way. Uh, he actually quote, he was actually quoted as saying, if the Russian revolution failed today, he is in Helsinki tomorrow, basically. Now, Lenin was okay. Lenin was all right. Lenin was like, you know what? If you want to break away from the Soviet Union, go ahead. If you want Russian help to create a workers' revolution in your country, okay. Now, Lenin dies in 1924. And there was a lot of wars that actually happened before Lenin's death. Like the reincorporation of Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Those were in 1921 after the Trans-Caucasian Union fell apart. There was the, I think Tuvan was actually part of Mongolia, but they were given as a gift, or they were given before imperialistic times, I can't remember. This is not really a world history thing, this is uh, more geopolitical, but world history and geopolitics are intertwined, so yeah. We're going for like another three minutes, we have already, we have already kind of conquered the basic stuff. Now, in this video... I will call it the Novo Russia policy because I think it's actually fitting because the Novo Russian state, the separatist back, non affiliated, non recognized state by the UN, of course, great job, UN, freaking brilliant, best thing you've done since the Rwandan genocide, I must say. No sarcasm, I'm being serious, I'm being totally serious. Has been kind of the most successful when it comes to Russian separatist groups. Normally when Russian separatists come in, it's mostly as a diversionary attack or to keep the country in line. But Nova Russia actually singles a more greater a more greater threat. It is actually wanting to expand proper. And remember the big word of the day is expand. Russia must, will, and will be paranoid if it does not expand. Of course I was talking about like expanding during World War One and stuff. Um, during World War II, they would expand again to protect the revolution and, of course, beat back fascism, which is the base. But they went over the line when they kind of went into pretty much East Berlin at that point. But that is for security because even before then, there was actually a secret pact to actually give Russia spears of influence in Eastern Europe. So this is before the Cold War. This is when FDR and Stalin were drinking champagne together champagne socialist much <laughs> but serious thought yeah they would actually drink champagne and have a good time and talk about the war and stuff like that so during this time there is no real sense that the russians needed to expand they do have influence in eastern europe but there's no reason to expand but as the war buzz Trum buzz fdr dies and the cold war kind of heats up and truman's anti-communism kind of rears its head you start to get the cold war and the facilitating of russia really needs these countries not to be influenced but directly rule from moscow because the nato the nato alliance which has not formed yet but is pretty much the western allies of world war ii can literally come into being right now and like everybody's war weary and everybody's ravaged by war right but russia or the soviet union at this point really kind of sees the writing on the wall and says look we need to expand we need to get big we need to get bigger so russia expands yet again and actually creates a lot of more it is expansionism for internal security and externally to push the revolution but of course but of course obviously to have external security 
because the more socialist states that are not really controlled but let's say controlled for the sake of obvious reasons pretty much controlled by you the more harder it is to really um the more harder it is to really get you right because you have socialist friends but um the wars of the sino vietnamese war the organ war um a lot of those communist versus communist wars should show why that's not a good idea but at the time before 1979 is the china soviet split another one too um it was at that time where it was like okay yeah okay we we might be surrounded but at the same time we're good now in closing remarks do i wish do i wish war because at the end of the day i know i know why everybody's here uh no i hope ukraine and russia does not go to war war is unjust war is brutal and war doesn't last even an eight-day war can have ramifications that last to this day so no i do not want a war but at the same time in 1938 1939 there was a toothbrush man who said he just wanted to do Sudetenland. He was just looking for the Germans, yeah. He was just looking out for the Germans. And then it was like, okay, we give this man the Sudetenland and he could probably get back into the world community and stuff, ain't it? Right, right. So this this toothbrush man again. This toothbrush man again answers for uh let's say uh Czechoslovakia. Right, hypothetical situation. This guy answers for Czechoslovakia, the, the United Kingdom and France. Are like, okay, bloke, you can have this land, but if, well, you can have the you you can have Czechoslovakia. We don't we don't care about them. I I know I know that he didn't technically ask for a whole country, but they were like, okay, Czechoslovakia, you have to die so we can save the rest of the world. Okay. Um, he obviously asked for Austria. But when it came time for Poland, it was already too late. Hitler has remobilized. Hitler had industrialized. And Hitler had 10 million law Germans ready to die for the Fuhrer. Now, Russia and Germany, especially in the 1940s, are different. But the key takeaway is that evil strives when good men do nothing. And like I said, I do not want war. I do not want that. But... Think about it. If Putin could take Ukraine today, what stops Putin from taking the Baltic states tomorrow? What stops Putin from moving bases to Leningrad? What stops Putin from taking Belarus? What stops taking what stops Putin from taking Czech or Slovakia? What stops Putin from taking well, they don't have to expand that far, but let's just let's let's do the let's do the former Soviet Union first. Um, they're already in Kyrgyzstan with the anti Almaty, well, the Almaty protests against the pretty much dictatorship, but passed down like Kim Il Sung kinda. Um, they. All right, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna be real with you. I'm gonna tell you the real reason besides internal, uh, external security. When we say internal security, Russia is an autocratic state, and Russia has been an autocratic state for. A long time Russia is huge the minute Russia became huge Russia must be an autocratic state just like China the bigger you get the more autocratic you have to be and America is big the United States is big but compared to that and they do have states so it's not like one huge central government ruling over them it's the collection of states within a country just like Canada it's more it's like a federation the United States of America so power is pretty much decentralized and the federal government does have the authority to overwrite certain state laws and bills that are unconstitutional but besides that they they can't do nothing so it is really decentralized but the main point of this is putin putin is really thinking to him, to himself is if this country on my border democratizes what is stopping the people from Russia? Because Russia, even being an autocratic state, still has live TV to have the veneer of being free and more democratic than the so-called West, you know? So, 
it, they have this veneer. I mean, Russians um, finally snap, especially with COVID. A lot of people are finally, you know, like really at their breaking point. When Russians see a successful protest that topples a former Soviet or even, you know, well, former Soviet at this point, yeah, former Soviet dictator or party member, Putin have to be like the writings on the wall. I have to give up power. And of course, Putin signed himself in for another five years. He does say he's going to give up power eventually, but um, what is stopping, what is stopping if Ukraine defends itself? That's a bigger, that's a bigger debt to the world, honestly, because then the people in Russia do realize that even though they're under an autocratic regime, they do have the power to stand up against Putin. And that is what Putin really doesn't want. You see it in Belarus. You saw it in Almaty or Kazakhstan. Even Kyrgyzstan last year. We all know that evil tribes when good people do nothing, right? So, we don't want nuclear war. We don't want a conventional war. But, if it may come to that... Let's just hope for a conventional war and not nuclear holocaust. This has been a kind of dim, uh, dim moment to a pretty lighthearted, pretty educational video. But I leave you with this: um, we all, we all so many to all so few. And with that, we'll end this no depressing ending. And I'm gonna get out of here before my grandmother comes for me. Um, anyway, I do hope you learned something. I do hope you enjoy this one. Um, there'll be a more formal video on this, but I just wanted to do something extra because I finally learned how to talk, so that's fun. So, with that being said, um, I'll edit out a couple of coughs, and um, yeah, I might let it go, but I might go edit out a couple of coughs. I need to realize I need to drink some water, so. Was it drinking water and talking? Yes. With that being said, my phone needs to charge. It'll probably cut out by itself, so let me just wrap it on my own terms. Ladies and gentlemen, NMB, hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. I don't, I'll make a proper video, but this is just like a meme-ish, pretty simple to understand video. I know my audience is not dumb, but it's better to digest something that is quick, easy, and quirky rather than something that's really like pretty to the point to pretty pretty no pretty void of any stuff but it's more the personality that talks rather than the words on the screen well the words that you hear well the words on the screen for me but um i thank you again for watching and um yeah i haven't gotten a call yet and i hope i don't get a call for the you but um yeah if I have, if I was called up, I guess I would have to go. But I'm not. Uh, I'm not a part of that region. So that's just what when I get called up is just basic training and the IT room for the rest of my days. But if one day I might have to get called up or do not regional security to defend the people's rights, as noble as I may sound, I will do it. But with that being said, um, hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. And until next time. Stay stay safe, sanitize, wear a mask, unless you're not around people, get some fresh air as well, and um, learn something. Till next time, bye-bye, and those are just the facts. I love that channel, dude. I'm going to link you a video. going to link you a video to that. Can I explain it a bit more? So anyway, later.